Okay, I will make a start. It's my pleasure to welcome Prof. Bopar for today's webinar. Prof. Bopar is a principal investigator at the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Illinois. He's the head of the Biophotonics Imaging Laboratory and along with a team of 25 researchers, is investigating novel optical diagnostic image imaging technologies for basic science and translational cl clinical applications. Borov Popart, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, Maria, and, and welcome to all those that are joining us today. Uh, it really is a pleasure to, to be here and present some of the work that we do and also talk a little bit about translational um, uh, strategies and how we take our ideas uh, from the lab into the clinic. And um, so what I'd like to talk about today is really focusing on biomedical optical imaging uh, technologies. And the setting for which we develop those uh, is in the context of uh, tumor margins and trying to identify in you know, oncology margins and markers and microenvironment and, and how we can use these label-free techniques to be able to do that. So just a few disclosures. Um, majority of the funding that I receive for our research here comes from uh, US federal agencies, but we also have sponsored projects from GSK, Texas Instruments, and Procter & Gamble. And I've been involved in starting uh, actually four companies, three are active, uh, as you can see there. Um, companies that are all developing different aspects of biomedical optical imaging technologies, and then again, translating those. So if we think about biomedical imaging in general, I tend to group this into uh, structure on one hand and being able to look at structure across many different scales, all the way from uh, the human body down to the molecular scale. But we also have to think about function. And at each of these scales, there is function that we want to understand and, 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 um, and investigate as ways of looking for changes in disease, such as metabolism is one example. And we're all familiar with the imaging technologies that are at this end of the scale. Um, but really, it's at the other end of the scale where disease starts that we're, we're, we're trying to develop new technologies for. And biophotonics is really the way to go for being able to provide that type of resolution at the cellular and molecular world. So we use light in what we do. And in my lab, the Biophotonics Imaging Laboratory at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign is really charged with developing things such as new hardware to do this. So new laser sources, imaging systems, all with an eye for looking at how we can develop and translate these into clinical applications. We develop software algorithms, of course, AI and other image processing um, algorithms that can extract more information out of the data we collect. And then we apply these to many different problems such as next generation microscopy, neurophotonics, label-free imaging, and ultimately translate these into clinical applications and human subjects with real clinical and medical problems. And I'll talk about these throughout, throughout my presentation today. In addition, as I mentioned, we connect with industry and, and I also am director of a, a GSK center for optical molecular imaging, which is really using these advanced imaging technologies um, to go after drug discovery and understand how drugs and molecules move within single cells or the tissues um, and really how efficacious they are, how safe they are. So we've got a great team that are looking at different types of, of, of molecules and drugs and again, trying to assess toxicity at the cellular molecular scale and really how these drugs um, across all this, this continuum from the cell all the way to the clinic. So I think that's a, a, a nice merger of how we interact with industry as well. In general, what we're trying to do is perform optical biopsies of tissue. And traditionally, you know, biopsies, physical biopsies are looked at under a microscope in the path lab. And what we thought about is, can we really change the paradigm for when, where, and how we assess tissue microscopically? Can we do that at the point of procedure or at the point of care in real time without the lengthy process that histology uses? Well, one way we do this is with a technique called optical coherence tomography or OCT. And OCT is really the optical analog to ultrasound, but instead we send in light waves and we collect those waves that come back, the reflections, and we build up images, either time-lapse or 3D images of structures based on their optical scattering properties. Now, these are label-free techniques. What you're looking at there is a beating tadpole heart that's about the size of the tip of your pencil. So really high resolution. And we can, we can use this technique to rapidly scan tissue. We get very good um, depth resolved structures of, of tissue based on the, the scattering properties of the tissue. Well, we applied this to breast, the problems in breast cancer. And in breast cancer, 
one thing that really bothered us was that typically uh, a lumpectomy procedure is performed to remove a breast mass um, and the surgeon removes that, will send it off to pathology. But roughly on average, 25 to 30% of the cases, um, at least here in the US, have to be recalled because pathology discovers that there's a positive margin or there's tumor cells left behind in the patient and the physician, the surgeon has to go back and remove additional tissue. So this is one area that clearly we wanted to intervene and, and really have developed imaging technologies that allow us to do this type of imaging during the surgery and assess those margins and hopefully avoid that the, the need to re-excise tissue. So with a large number of breast cancer cases worldwide, this is a huge potential savings economically, but also um, really less anxiety and, and stress for the patients and the families that have to, to go through these procedures. So this is one application where we used OCT. We developed a handheld probe that the surgeon would use. And what you're seeing there is a video as this probe is being swiped across the margin. And we see different structures. We see um, what looks like honeycomb structures, more linear structures. And, and this is what we set out to be able to, to demonstrate how useful that is. So we developed an imaging protocol where we could bring this technology into the operating room. And essentially, what we're after is determining whether or not uh, where those tumor cells are. Are they deep within the mass that was resected? That's, that then means it's a negative surgical margin. Is, are they close? Uh, or is it a positive margin, meaning there's tumor cells at the surface? And we are doing this with different types of imaging, whether it be more like a, a microscope, or there's a needle here, or that handheld probe that I showed you. And then we compare our images to what histology gets uh, later on um, after the tissue is sent there. So these are just some examples. On the, on the left are our, our OCT images. On the right, um, and here is shown the corresponding histology that came days later. Um, these are some examples of positive margins where you have a higher density of scattering at the surface. This is largely adipose tissue um, that's low scattering. But when you have these dense foci, these tend to be a tumor foci. So here's an example, the, again, the OCT image collected in real time and the corresponding histology that came days later for this really small um, foci of tumor cells that wouldn't be visually or, or tactically identified during surgery. We, our first study was done now quite a year, number of years ago, but this was looking at ex vivo samples that came out and we were able to, to get very good sensitivity and specificity for just detecting cancer, whether or not there's a positive margin in the operating room. Uh, more recently, we finished a, an in vivo study where we used our in vivo probe here, and the surgeon looked at the margins um, and about both the ex vivo tissue and the in vivo resection bed, and we got very good sensitivity and specificity uh, for using this, again, to identify those positive margins during surgery. So here's an example of kind of how this works. So a, a surgeon performs uh, a lumpectomy procedure uh, to remove that tumor mass, and um, we can go right away and look at the, uh, the, the in vivo margin. But if we look at it in the ex vivo sample, um, you know, we can identify areas that look normal, that look abnormal. And because we have tissue out, we can do histology. And that histology corresponds to what we just saw with OCT. Now, the ability then with OCT to look at the resection bed is shown here. And in this case, uh, this looked very suspicious for another positive margin. Now, this wasn't used to guide the surgery, but the, the surgeon decided to resect additional tissue because she felt like this was a positive margin. Um, when we looked at that additional margin that came out, uh, we agreed. It was also positive. We had seen that in vivo, and we did histology that showed cancer. Then finally, on the second, after the second resection, the surgeon went back in and looked, and, and we saw features that looked very normal. And the surgeon you know, basically wasn't going to resect any more. We don't have histology for that, but, uh, but this, I think, shows an example of kind of how this, um, how this particularly develops. Now, we can also, in addition to looking at margins, we can look at lymph nodes. And lymph nodes uh, are essentially the filters that collect tumor cells coming from, say, a, a tumor located somewhere in the body. And what we notice is that we see very different optical properties between a normal lymph node and a metastatic one, one that has tumor cells in it. Um, there's a reaction when this happens and the scattering properties change. So clearly we could see differences between those two. And we did a study 
looking at uh, quite a number of, of subjects and lymph nodes and, um, and our sensitivity and specificity weren't as high as the margins, margin study, but that was because we had a lot of additional artifacts we had to think about. So if there, were, if there was a thick layer of adipose tissue, it made us more difficult to see the lymph node. If there was any type of crush artifact, sometimes that would give an overly dense type lymph node. But still, we would have prevented a lot of these normal lymph nodes from being removed um, had the surgeon been using this technology to guide, guide that resection. So in general, what we're trying to do with this histopathology is ask, what can we do in real time at the point of the procedure? Can we collect, um, not necessarily wait for histology and, and these images that happen um, you know, days later, but can we actually do this type of OCT imaging in real time and collect this in minutes instead of days? So that's what really motivated us. But some of the, the, the fundamental problems that we had was with histology. This is a, you know, a very traditional uh, historical technique. It's our gold standard, right? This, this started you know, hundreds of years ago, um, but we do know that it's slow. It, it's, it's labor intensive. Ultimately, it's subjective in how we read those structures. And it's really only for ex vivo specimens. So we started thinking about from an engineer's perspective, how could we improve on this process that's, that's been established for so long? Well, images, if you think about it, images are the endpoint of histopathology. Um, and can we generate images in such a way that uh, circumvent a lot of these limitations that, that current histopathology has? Well, I think one of the main things is that current histopathology is just incompatible with real-time assessments of living tissues. Uh, and so this all relies on resecting tissue out. So when we started thinking about this from the optics point of view, we said, well, what does histology do? It takes out tissue, it sections it very thinly, puts it on a slide, it stains it to give contrast, and then you look under white light to look at the different types of contrast. Well, instead of doing all that, can't we just take fresh tissue or even in vivo and instead illuminate it with different properties of light and each one of those will give us a different type of contrast of that tissue. And we can tell things, certain things such as molecular composition, structural composition with collagen. So that was really the approach that we were taking. Can we generate molecular imaging contrast by programming the light that we wish to illuminate the tissue with? So instead of that histology that comes a day later, we get this wealth of new types of contrast from the tissue. This is all label-free endogenous contrast. So we're not putting in any stains or any dyes. This is just fresh tissue, not even sectioned, um, but basically being illuminated by different wavelengths of light and elucidating more of these nonlinear optical properties. And you can see there's a wide range of contrast. And one of the things I'll get to is this also reveals new markers, extracellular vesicles that are lost in standard histology, and yet we think have extremely valuable information about the tissue in, in the tumor. So what we get is a composite image like this, again, without any labels, but it's enough to tell us what are the structures, what are the molecular composition, what's the metabolic activity of these cells. And what you can see down here is a, this is a, a mammary tumor in a rat model. Uh, we can see structures like the blood vessels. We see those vesicles, those little blue dots. We see nerve structures here, adipose cells, just really a wealth of information that we want to tap into. Now, how do we do this? So we, we really shape and design the light. We customize the light to illuminate. And so that's the engineering aspect of my lab, where we divide, design new laser sources and optical sources to be able to do this. And, and, um, and so this has been highly enabling, but it's also something that, uh, you know, again, has a large number of biological and clinical applications. So um, many of you may be familiar with fluorescence where we put in uh, energy or light and something that has a, a fluorescent molecule will then fluoresce. Well, we can do this through nonlinear processes as well. And nonlinear processes really are a combination of multiple photons that interact in the tissue or at the site to generate a new photon um, that is indicative of that physical process or structure. So if we look at just fluorescence, it is also possible to have um, uh, you know, two or three photons arrive at the same time and generate 
a nonlinear process and a fluorescence. So that's what we call three photon or two photon fluorescence. Um, there's also what's called harmonic generation. So this excitation of a certain structure uh, can produce light. So third harmonic is very good at generating um, signals from interfaces between lipids and aqueous solutions, wherever there's a change in the refractive index. So we see structures based on those differences. Um, second harmonic generation probably is more commonly known, and it is specific for collagen or elastin based on the structural properties of those molecules. So what we have then is ways of looking at structure, ways of looking at autofluorescence, and that fluorescence can come from biomolecules like NADH or FAD that are involved in metabolism. So we can get a metabolic signature. Finally, there's CARS, coherent anti-Stokes Raman scattering, which is a vibrational system or process that is sensitive to lipids or proteins and depending on how we tune the lasers that illuminate the, the tissue. So again, hopefully you can see quite a range of options here. Now it's fortuitous that nature has given us a lot of autofluorescent molecules and structures that we can then image with these nonlinear techniques. And so you can see some of those shown here. Again, the collagen, the elastin, tryptophan, NADH, FAD. And these are really our targets for this label-free imaging. When we do that, we see images like this. And this is in vivo rat mammary tumor. It's label-free. Um, we see structures like cells. Um, and, and vessels and others, and, but we see different colors. And these colors correspond to metabolism. So for instance, we see cells over here that have a yellow cytoplasm. And then we see cells over here that have blue cytoplasm. And that really has to do with, again, the metabolic activity of those particular cell types, giving us different ratios of those colors. We can use this then to look at um, angiogenesis, other structures from within this, this tissue. You can see the large adipose cells here, um, the vessels that are, that are evident, and a lot of collagen just shown in green. Um, this is a, actually an in vivo neurovascular bundle. So the, this large structure across the, the diagonally here is a vein. It's, it's nearby is an artery. Um, we see in pink here, this is the, the myelin on um, uh, a nerve that's actually with along with that structure. And then we see adipose cells around that. We see collagen uh, in the stroma and we see fibroblasts, these yellow cells throughout the, the, the collagen as well. Now we can do this in vivo time lapse. So I hope this is coming through, um, but you can see a time lapse sequence. This is nearby a tumor and you can see blood flow through those vessels. We're also, also tracking individual cells. And we're seeing cells migrating to this area here where these, these immune cells are clustering. Uh, it's resetting here. But you can also see cells intravasating, extravasating in and out of the blood vessels. And this gives us a picture. Again, this is label-free, in vivo, without contrast agents. And we can see dynamic structures in addition to just the static ones. So with that, we can go back and we can analyze. We can track where those cells are migrating. We can look at their dynamics. They all seem to have the same type of bursting behavior. <clears throat> so they'll advance and then pause. And, and, and some, however, have very short paths. Others have very long paths, all within the same plane. And again, we can start to get different dynamics out of these cells. These are, this is more information than we get with histology. So I, I, just to transgress a little bit, um, you know, it's always bothered me with histology that we, we spend so much effort to take and, and acquire a physical biopsy from tissue deep within the body. What's the first thing we do when we finally retrieve that? We drop it into formalin and we kill it. We kill all the cells. We preserve the structure that histopathologists look for, but we're losing this dynamic information. And so that's really, I think, the advantage that an optical biopsy or a living biopsy would give us to be able to tap into more information about that. Now we've looked at comparing our images to standard histology. The problem is we see things that histology, H&E, and immunohistochemistry don't. Um, and so we're trying to correlate our images with H&E histology. And we always have to ask this question, do we present our images that provide new contrast or do we actually digitally convert our images to look like H&E 
our immunohistochemistry so that it can be interpreted you know, in, in standard ways. So that's a dil dilemma, but I think you appreciate the high dimension, dimensionality that we have of this data, and we really have to explore new ways and new contrast mechanisms. So in addition, much of the work I just showed was a lab system. We built a portable system that we could take into the clinic. And here uh, is all that system was put into a cart. Um, you'll see a little black box on top of the surface. That's covering a window, and that's where specimens are placed. They're covered up, and we get this type of, the same type of imaging of, of samples. This was coming from human breast tumor samples, and we see um, those vesicles also popping up uh, in high, uh, high numbers uh, in the tumor cases. These are some examples of images of human uh, breast tissue. So this is a normal human breast tissue. You see a lot of green collagen. The yellow are elastin fibers, and you see some adipose cells over here. Now compare and contrast that to tumor, where we see very disordered collagen. We also see a lot more purple and blue cells, and these are the tumor cells that are just, um, you know, pervasive, invading all throughout this tissue. So we're getting high-dimensional data, and how can we use that now? to actually look at um, automated or AI type approaches to be able to uh, assess and look, at, look for patterns that we can't see um, you know, with our own eyes. So as we all know, um, deep learning AI in biomedicine is pervasive now, and it is just uh, completely changing the way that we can extract information from the images or data that we get in medicine. Um, it, it is excellent at finding patterns and features that we can't perceive with the human eye and be able to do that across hundreds of thousands of images very rapidly. So uh, this type of data, like I said, is ripe for this type of analysis because we have such high dimensionality uh, and new contrast. So what we've done is we started using uh, a, a deep neural net to look at real-time diagnosis, uh, combining that stain-free uh, slide-free histopathology with this type of automated analysis. Now, the traditional way of doing this, as I described, you know, tissue comes out, they do histochemical processing, put this on slides, multiple pathologists may look at this and ultimately come to a diagnosis with a fairly low, you know, concordance rate, at least for breast cancer. But our thought is if we could have this real-time imaging, there's very minimal processing on the front end, you send those images directly into your DNN, and within seconds or minutes, you get um, an automated classification. And this really accelerates the time uh, that we can make these types of uh, assessments. So that's what we did. We, we took um, samples, you know, 72 sites from cancer subjects, 52 sites from healthy subjects. Uh, we actually tiled this data. We split this up into training, validation, and test sets. Uh, we tiled this so we really had, you know, tens of thousands of individual images. It, you might appreciate these are not just small fields of view. We've been collecting large fields of view here with multiple areas. And then run this through our model to generate, uh, generate a model and, and ultimately determine on either a per tile basis or a per slide basis, you know, what is the accuracy of this model for identifying cancer that's present? And you can see our numbers were quite good. Um, you know, looking at these signatures. And so ultimately we can come up with these classification activation maps that on almost a pixel by pixel basis begin to look at, you know, where are areas that are suspicious for cancer according to this algorithm and this training uh, that was done. Now, the other advantage that we can have with this type of analysis, we, we do a TISNI analysis, which looks at what images were used by the model to identify something as a true negative versus a true positive or your false positives and false negatives. So the true negatives were really the collagen fiber. So when a lot of the collagen fibers and the structures were there, that was more indicative of normal tissue. Uh, when there were these vesicles, extracellular vesicles uh, that were rich in NADH, those were indicative of true positives in cancer. And then in between were a lot of the mixed images of, of, with the elastin and adipocytes. And these uh, presented a little bit more challenge for this algorithm. But still, what we were interested in is because this algorithm was pulling out these vesicles, we wanted to spend more time thinking about those. So this was really a serendipitous discovery for us because when we first started imaging, uh, we saw this image. And, and we saw these, these blue, these point-like 
dots and objects. And we didn't know what these were. These don't show up on histology. Um, but the more we learned, the more we learned that these were extracellular vesicles, that the cells, tumor cells, are putting out for intercellular signaling throughout the organism. Um, our most recent paper just made the cover of PNAS, where we we're looking at these vesicles as diagnostic biomarkers for breast cancer. Now, these, these vesicles, I say extracellular vesicles, and there's really three types. The very smallest ones are exosomes that are uh, less than 150 nanometers in size. But then there's microvesicles that are a little bit larger, and then many might be familiar, familiar with apoptotic bodies that butt off. These are also considered vesicles. Our focus has really been on the microvesicles and the exosomes, and how we can analyze those label-free to tell us something about the tumor. So we are able to characterize, extract these, and there are a lot of methods. This is actually a very active area of research. There's a lot of methods to extract these vesicles and analyze those, but they do this in bulk, right? Whereas our ability to do this uh, can be by imaging. So we see a spatial orientation of these. Anyways, we, we can isolate these vesicles. Most people will do TEM to look at them, um, but we can actually, they, sh they show up as single point dots um, uh, diffraction limited spots on our images, but they also contain information because they have this multimodal signature. So if we look at, um, and these are extracellular vesicles from human cell cultures, if we look at a cell line that's very invasive and we take this ratio, this FAD divided by FAD plus NADPH, again, this is coming from a ratio of those nonlinear optical imaging channels, then we can actually um, look at those and, um, and look at a histogram. And what we see is for the more invasive cell lines, we see a histogram that's more centered around 0.5. And that's because we believe that we're sensing a high concentration of NADH, which makes sense. Tumor cells are metabolically active. The vesicles that they produce and secrete probably contain NADH in high amounts. Okay, so we looked at this from cell culture and then we recognize that this ratio is significantly lower in the cancer cells. Then what we did is we looked to the in vivo rat mammary tumors. And here, instead of uh, isolating vesicles, we looked at measuring these properties just even in vivo. And similarly, we saw that same trend. So we saw that there's um, the ratio of those tumor associated vesicles are more around 0.5 compared to the control. And we're able to statistically separate these um, with very high accuracy. Now, we come back to that clinical cart I mentioned, and the same cart can be used to quantify these vesicles. So in this study, we just looked at identifying the number of vesicles. And we saw, compared to normal cases, um, healthy um, tissue from breast reduction cases, um, the cancer um, tissue had much higher density of these vesicles. And in fact, that correlated with the aggressiveness of the tumor. And we also started looking at how those, the density of these vesicles change spatially over time. Um, what this indicates though, is that it's a way perhaps of identifying the aggressiveness of the tumor by simply looking at the metabolic content uh, within these vesicles that we can recover. So we went back to our human tissue and again, saw the same trend. So looking at human tissue uh, from lumpectomy specimens, we could grade, uh, and just by looking at the vesicles in this histogram, we could assess really what was the stage or the aggressiveness of that tumor. Now, one of the things that really intrigued us is that we also had, we only had two, um, but these were tissue that we received from breast cancer survivors. So no active cancer. Um, they had been treated years ago, and no active signs clinically. Uh, however, their vesicles contained a signature that matched that of a very aggressive breast cancer. So we don't know, was there underlying aggressive breast cancer that clinically just cannot be detected in any other way? Or did these vesicles really change the cells to ramp up their metabolism, the normal cells? And therefore, this is preconditioning the body, the tissue, to be receptive of a, a cancer and support that cancer. So these are really fundamental questions we're trying to address now. So we know that these vesicles produce these 
uh, or these tumor cells produce these vesicles. They send them off into the circulation. These EVs are taken up into normal cells. They induce metabolic changes by the cells. And our body becomes preconditioned to host these metabolic tumor cells that might, and metastatic tumor cells that come later. So that's a question. Does the body remain preconditioned after the tumor has been successfully even treated? Um, and that's one of the primary things we're, we're looking at now. But in all, this type of label-free multimodal imaging uh, allows us just a wealth of information that we have yet to tap into. And we think with AI and other computational approaches, we can get at this, but we really are challenging the, the standard of, uh, well, the gold standard of H&E and the immunohistochemistry with the information that we can provide here. So I just want to talk, just to kind of uh, close um, the last few minutes here, just to really talk about translating these technologies and what goes into thinking about this and how we can take these technologies from the lab you know, into commercial applications. And I look at this really as a cyclical process. So there's technology development, and then there's showing that it has enabling applications. So for the technology developments, it's all about, in our case, developing the sources, the systems, the software, the beam delivery. And then we have to explore how that can be applied. And we do things such as first testing in material phantoms, followed by in vitro cells and culture, uh, in vivo animal models, and then ultimately into clinical studies into humans. And one of the advantages that I think we have um, for this type of optical imaging is that this can be done label free. This can be done with very low power that's, that's not harmful to the tissue in any way. And so that's why we can actually take these into clinical studies very rapidly um, and first to human studies uh, of course, with IRB approvals and safety checks all in place, um, but we don't necessarily need to have, you know, FDA approval in the U.S. to be able to do these human studies. Now, if we think about, if I think about our healthcare system here in the U.S. at least, I tend to break it down into these four areas, right? You've got primary care, um, you've got emergency care, there's surgery, and then there's a lot of specialists in medicine. And if we think about, as one example, a lot of technology is directed toward the specialist. So in the case of OCT for ophthalmology, there's many systems that are geared toward um, giving tools to the ophthalmologist. However, what we started thinking about is what about the front line, primary care? And if we look at primary care, and we look at emergency rooms, there are optical instruments there. There's the otoscope, the ophthalmoscope. Um, and they're used there. It's imaging, right, used in these settings. So this, in fact, was one area of, of research that led to this development of technology, OCT, to look in primary care, to look in the ear. Right now, uh, ear infections are diagnosed just by looking at the surface of the eardrum, but the infection is really inside, behind the eardrum. And so OCT allows us to look inside the ear look at all these effusions and biofilms and see things that haven't been seen before. And so this is a technology that we think is highly enabling. It addresses a, a major problem. About 99% of kids will have ear infections. About, and you know, about a large percentage will go on to even having chronic problems in tubes. So as a result of this, uh, as we develop this uh, out of the lab into clinical studies, Photonicare was one company, a startup company that we established to be able to take this technology, commercialize it, and advance it and disseminate it for, for other use. So this is um, really an act, you know, active. They're doing clinical studies in the, in the U.S. And, and, and beginning in the U.K. and elsewhere. Um, but it's an example of how we translate that technology. Now, another is the operating room. And this is just a just to kind of summarize what I shared with you today. So this type of handheld probe, we develop in the lab, we do first to human studies uh, with clinical partners, and then this can be commercialized, spun out to a company that then really refines the technology, um, develops and explores the market and be able to disseminate, disseminate that more widely. Uh, finally, that's specialist, and, and that was the example I talked about. The pathologist, how can we address the pathologist needs? Well, that's with this multimodal technology and, and really developing a light source, a platform, uh, a system that allows then this to be used for that real-time living biopsy or that real-time uh, optical biopsy in histopathology. So collectively, 
we've probably heard this, this phrase bench to bedside. And that's about taking a technology, first identifying a healthcare need, and then taking that from the bench, um, translating it into you know, an application to the bedside. But I would contend that's only halfway there. And we really need to go from the patient to the population. And we do that with commercialization, with industry partnerships, with government assistance. And we really have to take that technology and benchmark it against the standard of care. We do larger clinical trials and then ultimately really investigate how that technology is adopted and integrated to become the new standard of care. Um, I would contend that a lot of technologies are going to fail here because the workflow, the clinical workflow is so regimented that it's difficult to change much. It's there for a reason. It's worked out. It's been efficient. It's worked out for years, but now you're trying to change that with new technology. So that's not an easy task. And it's something I would say that we have to focus more on this, the left half of this, this process than the right half. Well, my other uh, advice, I think, from uh, this type of activity is how do we transverse this valley of death for innovation? So I don't know if everyone's heard of this, but it's really this point, this valley of death, where companies that get started, many of them fail. And it's, it, they fail because there's like a funding gap or there's, there's this difficulty in proving the clinical implementation of their technology. And you'll see kind of this, 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 this line maps cumulative profits and loss before they start really making you know, a profit and succeed as a business. So the thought here, most companies, startup companies kind of enter on this path, right? This downward path and they head toward that valley. But the thought that we've learned is that you really want to gain momentum from federal and private funding, possibly even early industry sponsored research, the academic prototypes that we generate should be very close to commercial prototypes, um, particularly for clinical studies. And you saw some of the carts that we've designed. You want those have to be looking like clinical prototypes if you're going to take them into a clinical setting. But this is also what investors and companies uh, like to see. And, and if you've got this, this launch point, you have this trajectory that perhaps you can get over this valley of death. And this also requires a striking a balance between performance and practicality. And for many of engineers that are out there, um, we love complexity, right? We really get excited about all the knobs and bells and whistles and wires and, and components, but that's actually out completely opposite of what's needed in a lot of these healthcare technologies. So this academic research tends to drive um, um, complexity to improve the performance, but commercialization really requires the practical reduction of that for cost containment and for adoption, particularly in medicine. Well, I just wanted to, to a few other points here. One is um, how do we change this th way of thinking? And um, you may have saw one of my titles as executive associate dean of, of Carl Illinois College of Medicine. This was a college that we just started uh, roughly about eight years ago at the University of Illinois. And it's really what we think is the world's first engineering-based college of medicine. It's to recognize that technology, innovation, engineering has to be integral even in the training of our physicians if we're going to make this change. And we truly believe that the future of healthcare lies at the intersection of medicine and engineering. And what we've developed is a curriculum. It's a four-year MD curriculum, but there's engineering that's infused throughout. So in phase one, we have preclinical, we have clinical cases uh, that our students are learning, but these are infused with engineering principles and innovation. In phase two, as students round on patients and clinics, we also have engineering rounds where engineers are with them trying to encourage students to think about what are the technology or innovations that can come, uh, what ideas are generated to help address these patient problems. And finally, in phase three, there's design and data science and capstone projects where they'll take one of these ideas and really develop it, potentially even to the point where it can be commercialized. And what we're really trying to do is train the next generation of physicians to also think about innovation, about entrepreneurialism, about engineering and science as well. And we think that that integration is really going to change the way we deliver healthcare, uh, the costs, uh, as well as the accessibility of healthcare. So I think the other element, because I've been talking about imaging, the other element I wanna emphasize is there's truly a personal power of images. And these images that we've generated 
uh, for this particular imaging modality surprised us and really inspired um, us to think about what we're seeing. Uh, this also inspired patients. This is um, uh, uh, one of our nurse caregivers at the clinic that we work with. She's a breast cancer survivor. Um, and she saw these images and were, was so moved by this view of breast cancer uh, that she decided to paint this as well. This was, she's an artist. This is her way of confronting the tumor that she faced. And, and it just really is, I think, an example of, of, of how these images can not only inspire, but also have a very personal contact of where people can confront the diseases that they might have. So I want to thank, I've got a great group uh, of, of students and postdocs and research scientists um, at our Beckman Institute on, on campus of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And we work with a number of different collaborators and um, medical uh, and cl uh, collaborators and clinicians and funded by a lot of federal agency support and industry support as well. Uh, but to, together, it, it takes this interdisciplinary team to really address these types of challenges and problems. And we're really excited about, you know, looking at the next problem and challenge that we can take on. So thank you very much for, for your attention. I'd be happy to spend the rest of the time answering any questions about any of these topics uh, that might come to mind. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prof, for such an informative and interesting lecture and allowing, allowing us to learn more about all the recent advance, advancements in the field. Uh, we have one question from Chloe. Uh, what are the main challenges that you face from bringing the real-time imaging technology to every operating theater in order to improve patient care? Yeah, so good question. There, there is a lot of challenges in the logistics of doing this. And we work with a number of great uh, collaborative uh, surgeons and physicians uh, that certainly welcome us. They understand what we're trying to do. They welcome us into their operating rooms and, and theaters. Um, we you know, obviously have to go through IRB approval so we can demonstrate that these technologies are safe. A lot of the times we work on the ex vivo tissue, so that's a lower threshold. But when we do do in vivo imaging, we obviously have to prove the safety. Um, the fact that we don't use contrast agents, that we have low power light, um, these are all you know, things that assure um, the safety uh, of this technology. Um, that's still, then we also have to work with a lot of the, the staff and the nursing staff and support staff in the hospital because we are bringing an instrument into the operating room. This has to be, you know, sterilized, disinfected, sterilized. We're usually off in an adjacent corner or even a, a frozen section room, an adjacent room, a surgical pathology room. Um, and, and, you know, working through all those operations. Then we also have to work with the protocols. So as I mentioned, the standard protocol, they take tissue out and they put it right into formalin to fix it and kill it, kill the tissue, preserve it. And, um, but for us, we want fresh tissue. And so that required a subtle change. Uh, we are still within, you know, the national uh, policy guidelines that we, we have only a so amount of time, just five to 10 minutes to image the fresh tissue before it has to be fixed. Um, so we're still within those, those policy limits and guidelines. Um, but you know, that's a change in protocol. So we, we've had, we, can't, we can't count the number of times that someone inadvertently took the tissue, put it into a fixative instead of allowing us to image it you know, fresh for a few minutes. So those are some of the challenges. But, but certainly I think a good collaborative team um, behind this idea would work together to, to address these. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and this brings us to the end of the webinar. Again, uh, uh, a big thank you for joining us today. And we will aim to release um, this uh, webinar tomorrow at our YouTube channel. Thank you again. Thank you.